Am I not mic'd? Sorry, thanks. So you get a great chance for everyone to be together in North America who actually love, love Python. It's a really good event. So if you ever get a chance to go to PyCon, um, I would highly recommend it. Uh, there's also some local equivalents. Um, there is an equivalent uh, called PyBay, which just started last year. I went and it was actually, uh, it's like a mini PyCon. It was actually pretty fun. I really liked it. I had some handshaking. That's really good. Um, so if you don't like, um, oh, PyBay. How many people have been to PyBay then? Cool. All right. A few more hands. That's really cool. That's coming up, I believe, in August. I don't think tickets are available just yet. So just know that that's out there too. And unofficially, um, a few years ago, for a long time, I would actually put together this event called Post PyCon Videos. And we would actually do like a mini little PyCon in our area. We would watch the videos that were already streaming. Well, why would we do that? You can do that at home. But at the same time, it's that idea of you get together with other people, talk about the videos, uh, have an open space as well. And that's, that's had really good luck. It's been on hiatus for quite a while. I can't promise I'm going to do it this year because the people I want to do it with don't know that I want to do it with them yet. So, so we shall see how that turns out when I pitch the idea to them. However, be on the lookout for uh, doing a post PyCon video tutorial within a month or two if all goes well. Uh, so there are lots of things to do, and of course, come here next month at the same time, uh, and we'll have even more Python, uh, and there are lots of other groups in the area. So what we like to do, uh, besides just socializing and getting to know each other, we also like to give announcements. So this is a great time to say, um, I'm looking for work, or a great time to say, I'm looking to hire someone. Now, we see a great variety depending upon the market. I remember in 2007, the idea of, I'm looking to hire was crickets, and I'm looking for work was half the room, if not most of the room. And then a few years ago, it was quite the opposite. So I don't know where we are now. Last time I asked, it was like, I think people were too afraid to say anything. So I'm giving you plenty of time to think about it for a second. And if you're looking for work, now would be a great time to just come up behind the microphone right there and just say a couple of words of, hey, I'm looking for work. Or you could even stand up, but it would be nice if you're behind the microphone so people can see you. By the way, we are live streaming now too, so there might be people looking to might hire you as well. Um, and we just give your name and a way of contacting you, and then people might be able to reach out and say, hey, I'm going to try to kind, kind of try to hire you. Does any brave souls want to stand up behind the mic and say, yes, I'm looking for, to work? Hi, I'm Mark. I don't want to take any time now, but if anybody wants to talk after the meeting, um, I'll hang around for a couple minutes. You're looking to hire or looking for work? I'm looking for work. All right, great. Um, Python, C, Java, SQL. Cool. Very cool. Any other brave souls who are looking for work? Hi. Eight years ago, I found a terrific job at Palo Alto Research Center through Bay Piggies, and okay. they let me write lots of Python, but now I'm looking for work. I'd be happy to chat with people. Cool. You found it through Bay Piggies. I like that. That was cool. I'm, uh, I'm Fred. I have about uh, 12 years in experience in software QA contracting. I just finished a contract at Intel where I wrote some Python scripts, and I'm looking for my next contract or a permanent position. Cool. Hi, I'm David Clark. I'm a data science consultant. I have a degree in astronomy. I switched careers to data science. I've been have a startup experience. Experience with TensorFlow, Pandas, Bouquet, Flask. Um, I'm looking for more opportunities and work. So please contact me. Look for me afterwards. Thanks. And gave us talk here at Bay Piggies in the past. Hi, I'm Reggie Dugard. I'm uh, taller than this mic. Um, <laughs> I'm basically a full stack developer. I've been using Python since 152, but lately I've been doing Django and things like that. I work for a small company, but that's closing an office. So I'm up in the East Bay, San Francisco, anything around there? Now I have to say, uh, I worked with Reggie as a contractor at one point on, I think at the same company and uh, really, really good people and a great person to work for. So if you get a chance, uh, Reggie is really, really, really awesome and valuable. Anyone else? Anyone else wants to get hired or brave enough to say so now? All right, anyone else who's actually looking to hire? I think last time, anybody looking to hire? Yeah. Hi, I'm Nick. Um, I work at a small company right here in Mountain View. We're actually moving to San Jose soon, so keep that in mind for your commute purposes. Um, we build um, what's essentially accounting software for lawyers, but 
the inside of it is a lot more fun because it's an awful lot of numbers and it's all Python and Django. Um, we're a small but growing team. There are 25 of us now. There were three two years ago. We're hoping it'll be like 50 by the end of the year and much more than that next year. We closed a good Series A and we have a lot of work ahead of us and we'd love if you guys could join us. Uh, so we're hiring lots of Python and lots of full stack. Um, I'll be hanging out a couple minutes afterwards, so come find me. Anyone else looking to hire? Good announcement, by the way. Come on up for a second. <clears throat> so hi, my name is Paulo Santana. I work, oops, I work here at LinkedIn, and uh, I manage a team called Python Foundation in Tools Engineering. And uh, so it's Vesla over there, you, common face here, you guys probably saw him many times. And uh, yeah, we're always looking for our great Python engineers. So uh, if you want to chat with us later this time or any time around, be very welcome to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, LinkedIn has been one of our, uh, has been our main uh, host for a place to meet and free food for several years now. Uh, two, maybe three years. I can't remember. Tony, do you remember if it's three or three years? Three, oh, oh, maybe even three or four. So LinkedIn's been incredibly generous to us. They've never asked for anything. They just always give us the space uh, and they give us food. Even when we don't ask for food, they just keep giving it to us, which is awesome. So uh, if that's any indication of what it's like to work for them, then I imagine it's a pretty fun place to work. Anyone else uh, looking to hire? Going once? Nope. All right, cool. So if there are any other announcements, you don't have to be looking for work. You can actually just say, look, I've got this really great thing I want to talk about. Uh, I've really got this really cool stuff, like a particular program that I just worked with, or I particular did this, or uh, yeah, OK, come on up. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I'm Dan. I have three announcements. Um, I do have a cool side project that's using Python and machine learning to predict the stock market. So if you're looking for a, a fun side project, come and look for me. So that's my, my first announcement. The second announcement is I will be presenting here in August. So I invite you all to come and watch my presentation in August. And it will be about the stock market and Python and <laughs> machine learning. OK. And also, um, I want to announce that I'm, I'm teaching three classes through Santa Clara Adult Education. Um, I have flyers. The first one is uh, build machine learning applications with Linux, Python, and Spark. Uh, the next one is project-based Python. And the last one is data science of time series. So I invite you all to come and look for me. I have flyers. And the classes start, the first one starts on June the 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Any fun project you've worked on you want to share, you're dying to share? Surely there's something. Okay. Um, I have one quick announcement I would like to make myself. Um, so at PyCon, uh, we tried something new. Uh, we wanted to increase the diversity at PyCon. So um, I was looking for about three years um, for a way of doing so. Uh, I, there was, we wanted to try to increase uh, the amount of uh, people of color at our event. And so I spent for three years trying to do so. And I found something called the Hidden Genius Project. And the Hidden Genius Project really mentors uh, black young uh, male youth to be able to learn technology and uh, entrepreneurship and um, really just, uh, and, and, and leadership as well. So they, they really came to PyCon for the very first time. We raised money here and many of you supported them. I really appreciate that. They were overwhelmed in a good way. They had no idea the conference would be so good. And I have lots of pictures I want to share with you. But for, I just want to say thank you for your generosity. For those of you who helped us uh, get these young men to PyCon, they had no idea that there was such a big conference and it was so welcoming and so inviting. So I would say that it looked like that EDS cat herding video in many ways. If you've ever seen that video, uh, search for cat herding EDS and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. There were times it was a little overwhelming for all of us to, to get everything in the right place. But overall, I think it was a huge success. Um, I actually had signed up for the 5K. It's an event at uh, PyCon as well. And I uh, wasn't feeling like running. I kind of hurt myself. I wasn't sure I was going to run or not. And then I was like, oh, I'll probably run. And then one of the, the young men said, I, I, I heard about this 5K, but I can't get a ticket. I want to run. I'm like, you can have my ticket. <laughs> not a problem. Anyone first place. <laughs> my number won first place. It had nothing to do with me, but hey, my, my badge won first place. And the, uh, the prize from that was a free ticket to PyCon next year. So already we already see this becoming self-sustaining in some particular way. So. <laughs> So I just want to say, if you've never heard of the Hidden Genius Project, we're really working with them to try to join them with the Python community. And I just thought that was, I just want to share that. It was really cool. Any other announcements before we start speaking tonight? No? All right. So I'd like to quickly introduce Jacques from Vertigus. Did I say it right? 
Oh, wait, good. Jacques, come on up. Um, I worked uh, in data science a little bit before at UC Berkeley, but it was before all the cool to toys and tools and everything was around. I wish it was now we would be able to play with such things. And I can't wait to hear more about Bowtie and how it works, especially since we have interactive dashboards, but they're not that interactive. So I'd love to maybe change that. Definitely. Oh, wait, you have a mic. So you I do have a mic. All right. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. This is an awesome turnout, more than I ever anticipated. So uh, this is awesome. Um, uh, and thank you for the kind of introduction. Uh, that was very nice. Um, so my name is Jacques, um, uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, a library that I made uh, uh, called Bowtie that lets you make interactive dashboards uh, in Python. So basically, this is going to be the story kind of, of how Bowtie came to be. Uh, what you can do with it, and kind of what I hope comes of it. So uh, with that, um, I have sort of a side diversion to get, get us sort of started here. Um, I sort of had the, this anonymous chat, so I see there's some of you with laptops. Um, uh, this is just uh, not really a goal of Python, but um, if I, let's see if I can get this to open up here. Uh, so if any, any of you want to go, do this, uh, go to this site, you can. Uh, it is live. Um, if I increase it, and you can just uh, type some text in, and then uh, it's totally anonymous. So I hope that's not a bad idea. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, maybe I'll check in with it a little later. Um, but anyway, uh, if you want to have some fun, uh, go ahead. Um, maybe I'll show that a little bit later. It's around 50 lines of code. Um, it's kind of fun. Um, so anyway, uh, getting started, uh, maybe I'll introduce myself a little bit. So who am I? Um, basically, I'm a computer engineer turned data scientist. Um, I think that happened once I started using a Mac. Um, <laughs> I, I work at an energy analytics startup called Vertigress Technologies. Um, basically, there we monitor energy from buildings, and we try to help make them run better. Uh, so that's my day job. Um, I work on Bowtie just on my own time, so it's not really job specific. Um, I've been a heavy user for about three to five years, um, and I'm not a friend and developer, so I've learned this all kind of in the last year, so there may be plenty of mistakes I'm making, but it seems to work okay for now, so I'm pretty happy with it. Um, so let's go on to the what I want to talk about today. So first, like, why did I start this project? Um, like, what was my motivation? Um, then I want to talk about like how do you get how can you get started like as a new user uh, get started really fast really easy so you guys can start playing around with your own bow tie dashboards. Um, then some tips around how to make it so you can do this really fast some rapid prototyping tips because I want the want the user experience of bow tie to be very seamless painless easy and fast. Um, then I'll get into some advanced features really show off some of the advanced interactivity that you can do with bow tie. Um, how to deploy it and share with others. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the tech stack so you guys can see like how it's working behind the scenes. And then kind of end with some future work and, and the kind of the goals I have for the project. Um, one thing I won't be discussing is similar tools and that's kind of for two reasons. Um, one, I haven't tried that many in depth. I, so I don't really know them that, I'm not really that familiar with them. And also I just prefer to focus on positive aspects of Bowtie and let you guys make the decision for yourselves. So uh, what was my motivation for this? Um, basically, this is just some side project I had. I had the kind of thought like a year ago is when I started working on this. But basically, uh, I was working on the job. I wanted to essentially generate a chart from another chart. So essentially, I wanted to click on some points and see some more data about those points. And I wanted to do that interactively by clicking on data by selecting data points and having more, like uh, having more charts pop up or new tables pop up that contain information about those points I selected. And I didn't want to do that programmatically because um, for some tasks, it's just easier to do it graphically. Um, and so here's, uh, this is one of the uh, apps that I have on the gallery if you ever visited the, uh, my GitHub site. Um, this wasn't what I was doing for work, but this is um, sort of a toy dashboard that I made. So, um, so what's going on here is I have, uh, let's see, that is, you guys can't really read that text, unfortunately. Um, but I'll describe what the two charts are. 
So uh, this is the IRIS data set. So um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the IRIS data set. Um, maybe, well, not that many, maybe like uh, 20 people or so. Um, so the IRIS data set is a data set that was collected by, um, uh, by, a by a biologist, I believe, about some flowers back like last century, a long time ago. Um, and it contains, uh, so he collected a bunch of data by hand, um, painstakingly, and, collect and like measured various aspects of the uh, flower petals and sepals um, for a few different species of flower. Um, and so that's what I have plotted here. So there's four attributes um, that I have plotted in a parallel plot. And then um, on the top plot, I have a, a reduced dimensionality view of that data. So I've used a machine learning algorithm called TSNE, if any of you are familiar with it. Um, I won't go into details of how that works, but basically it tries to somehow preserve the dimensionality of the four dimensional data and, and compress it in two dimensions. And what I've done here is I've basically sized the bubbles of the different of the different data points based off of the distance to their kth nearest neighbor. Um, so you can see like these points here have very large bubbles because uh, they're uh, farther apart um, in this in this two dimensional space. Uh, so you could, in some, some respects, consider those to be outliers. And so what I did in this screenshot is I, is I clicked on this point and then it, and it automatically highlighted this line for me. So I can actually see like, what actually, like in the original dimension, like what is the actual, like what does the anomaly actually look like? And you can kind of tell that uh, for most of the points that have like these, um, that have these low values here, like the, the, plot, the this dimensionality usually increases. But for this flower, for some reason, when he measured it, this, this attribute was kind of low. So it, so it's kind of an interesting way um, uh, uh, of looking at your data where it's more interactive and you don't need to do any programming, uh, you just, well, you do need to do some programming to set up the dashboard, but once you have the dashboard set up, you can just click, click through points and, and, and explore your data that way. So, um, so that was sort of my motivation, and I wanted to try to figure out, uh, were there any tools that would let me do that? Um, number one, the number one constraint I had, I didn't want to use R. Uh, I've used R in the past. I'm not a fan. I'm not, uh, that's probably because I'm not a statistician. I grew up in computer science, and so I, <laughs> it didn't really, I didn't really consider it shiny. Um, so then I started looking for solutions in Python. And there's a number of solutions. If you've looked around, you've probably seen them yourself. Um, things like Pixly, Dash. Um, I think Bokeh has some things. Um, or you can just build it from scratch using uh, web application frameworks like Flask or Django. Um, but ultimately, uh, I found every, every time I tried to use one of those libraries, I found it a little too difficult to use. Like I thought this should be way easier. There's way too much headache and pain uh, to set up a dashboard each time. So uh, I thought like this has to be, it has to be a better way. Um, to quote Raymond, Raymond Henninger, I think. Um, and so I thought it'd be fun to write something. And so uh, this leads to that scenario. So uh, my initial thoughts on like, on where to proceed from here. So I want to write something. Uh, how can I get something? How can I get something working? So at the time, I had been a coworker had introduced me to Plotly. Um, if any of you guys have used Plotly before, it's a pretty cool JavaScript plotting library, um, kind of similar to Bokeh. Um, it's, it has many similar similarities to Bokeh. One thing I liked about Plotly is that it had many different types of events that I could that they expose. So they have things like uh, selection events, uh, click events, and hover events that I can that I can tap into. Um, second thing was I needed to figure out a way to communicate between Python and, and JavaScript. So how, do, how can I get the, those JavaScript events back into a Python, um, Python process? Like I don't want to write a bunch of JavaScript. Like I want to write JavaScript once. That's my JavaScript that I write for Bowtie and then, and then I'm done with it. I want to write everything in Python. Um, and then uh, the, this tool called Dash from Plotly um, actually used Socket.io, which is where I got the idea, and they used it to a certain amount of success for their dashboard tool. And so I thought that looked like they had a pretty slick solution there. So I, I took their idea and kind of ran with it. Um, and that was pretty much a good enough for a proof of concept. So, you know, fast forward a few months of working on this in, the, in my spare time, and now we're ready to write our first Bowtie app. Um, so each app has approximately three parts. Um, first, you need to choose the components in your app, you know, whether you want tables, plots, drop downs, sliders, what have you, what widgets you want to have. Um, then you need to write essentially the interactivity 
uh, in your dashboard. So this involves writing callbacks that'll that'll run code in response to uh, in response to the JavaScript events. Then basically you need to lay out lay out all the components and connect everything up. Just basically tie all the tubes together. Um, so first, but first before we get started, we need to get some prereqs. So Fortunately, this is kind of a leaky abstraction, but you need to get some JavaScript uh, tooling out of the way so you can start using this. So in particular, we need um, Node, and Node will provide us uh, Webpack and Yarn, uh, which are, if you're not familiar with that, I wasn't familiar with that before I started using, before I started getting into this, but Webpack is basically a way to uh, bundle up all your JavaScript libraries and put it into like one file and minimize it for you. So that's what that is for. And Yarn is a way for me to grab uh, JavaScript libraries from NPM. So basically, if I want to download uh, Plotly and a bunch of the widgets that I want to use, I can use Yarn to grab those things uh, from the NPM re repository, very similar to uh, PyPy. Um, and so that's how you would install it on Mac OS. Um, I haven't tried using this on other operating sy systems, so apologies for that. Um, and then all you have to do is install Bowtie. So it's pip installable. Um, it works on both Python 2 and 3. Although admittedly, I'm using pretty much Python 3.6 exclusively now, so Python 2 may be less well tested, but it should, in theory, work. Uh, and so that's so now we're ready to get going. Um, cool. So now we can select our. So the first step in building our Python app is our Bowtie app is select uh, the components that you want to use. So these are the widgets that are going to exist in your app, and the full list of these components is on. Is on the read doc, is on read the docs where I have all this documentation on there. Um, but roughly, you can split the split the number of the widgets into two categories: ones ones for visual, and one that are strictly for controllers or controlling different things. Um, so the visual apps that I or w visual widgets that I have are Plotly, uh, Plotly widget, an SVG widget which can which you can send Matplotlib plots to, and then tables. Uh, the controllers. Uh, just a select few include things like date pickers, drop downs, text uh, text boxes, sliders, toggles, and buttons. Uh, and then this is an example of like what that would look like uh, in a Python dashboard. So all you got to do is from bowtie.visual or from bowtie.control import the widgets that you want to use. So here I'm just install I'm just importing the Plotly widget and the drop down widget, and then I'm just instantiating them. Um, there are some configuration options that you can give these give these guys, but right now I'm just giving using the defaults. Um, so then, briefly, what do these components do? Um, so essentially, what all these components do is they have instructions uh, for displaying themselves in a web page. So um, things like uh, they have an associated React component um, that I use to uh, to uh, tell itself how to how to how to display itself on a web page, and also the associated NPM package that I need to install, or JavaScript package. Um, there are commands that I can give these widgets. So, for instance, for Plotly graphs, I can give it I can give it commands to update itself with um, new data, uh, new configuration options um, that I can I just run with Python, and then it takes care of. Then behind the scenes, it takes care of sending all that data uh, to the to the JavaScript front end. Um, I can also these things also define events. So obviously we want to use events like click events or selection events. Um, these are all prefixed with on underscore. So for instance, my plot, um, my plotly widget has like a dot on click event. Um, so I can use that um, to hook into click events when someone clicks on the plot. Uh, and then lastly, I have uh, getters so I can get the current state of various widgets. So for instance, if I want to get the current state of a slider or a dropdown, I can get the currently selected value. Um, and then um, I'll try to take a quick, I'll give you a quick glimpse of like what this looks like in the docs so you can see how this looks and uh, how you can kind of navigate things. Uh, so this is uh, what the dropdown widget looks like. So um, this is just an example, but uh, uh, so as you can see, uh, the dropdown uh, as, as, as input parameters, uh, you can give it a list of labels and values, um, and so those are going to be the labels are the things that are going to show up um, on the on the widget itself, and the values are just associated values. For instance, so for instance, um, if I give a if I have like a list of buildings from a from a Postgres table, for instance, my list of labels might be the names of those buildings, and then 
and then the values could be like uh, the, the IDs or the unique IDs uh, from that Postgres table. Um, and that's basically, and then um, you can also have uh, multi, multi selection dropdown or just single selection dropdown. Um, and then here's the, here's the command that you can give it if you want. So you can, you can programmatically uh, update the chosen value with this do choose uh, method and then you just pass in which value or values you want to, you want the dropdown to choose. And normally you would, the user would just select it, but you can also do it programmatically if you ever desire. Um, you can also update the options that are available. So, uh, and then you can also get the current value of whatever the current selection value is of the dropdown. And then uh, if you want to hook into uh, when the selection is updated, then you can just use this on change, um, this on change event. So that's a little bit a brief glimpse of what that looks like. Let me close that. Uh, let me get mouse. All right. Um, now we're ready to find the callbacks. So, um, so the callbacks are where basically we write all the interactivity in our dashboard. Um, that's where all the all the events will trigger these callbacks. Um, and so this is an example of of a callback that we could. Uh, right. Um, so Plotly wrapper, uh, you can ignore that for now, but basically it's just a way for me to generate Plotly plots pretty easily. Um, I didn't really, I was a huge fan of the, their default API, so I just made like a simpler one. Um, but essentially what I wrote here is just a, a callback that will get run in response to a dropdown uh, selection. And so that item is is the value, the label and the value from that dropdown. It's passed as a, as a dictionary. And I'm keying into that dictionary uh, with value, which is the value, the currently selected value, and just creating the plotly um, plot. And then I'm sending, uh, and then I'm updating the plotly plot by giving the plot the do that do all command. So essentially, what in a nutshell, what's happening is when when someone selects the dropdown, uh, the plot the plotly plot will get updated um, with that new plot that I made with that with that line command. Uh, if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, uh, we'll see it later in action um, soon. So uh, hold tight. Um, uh, and so like I said, um, the value passed into item is basically a, just the Python dictionary and has two keys, the label and the value. Um, and, then, and then we update the plot with, like I said, with a do all method. And so once we have all our callbacks defined, now we're ready to lay out the app. Um, so we've chosen, we've chosen everything, we've written everything. Um, now we have this last block of code to write. And so I'll go through this in, in chunks. Um, but first, uh, we have this command decorator uh, that turns, our, turns this uh, Python code into a command line interface. And so this just makes it easier to basically run the Bowtie dashboard and build it and, and makes it so it abstracts away a lot of the nasty details underneath the, underneath the scenes. Um, then, uh, we construct uh, our layout uh, layout object. Um, that's kind of the default. That's how you build build a bow tie dashboard essentially. And then on that layout object, we add our widgets. So we first add the plot, um, and that just goes in the main. Well, we'll see this in action later. But um, we add the plot to the layout, and then we add uh, our drop down to the sidebar. And so that'll just be a, a control sidebar that we have. And lastly, we need to hook up the callback. Uh, to our event. So we just subscribe. We just use the subscribe function, which uh, as its first argument is just the function that we want to call, and then we give it the we give it the drop down event that we want to we want to use. And then lastly, we just need to uh, build the build the app, and then um, that's essentially all the code that we need to write. Um, so we're done with writing the writing the bowtie dashboard. And now we're uh, back to our command line interface. Um, so now we just need to build it and run it. Um, so the CLI that I mentioned before, the command line interface, um, it provides a few different commands. Basically, we can build it, we can recompile the app for development, for production, and also serve our Bowtie app. Um, but first, all we, all we need to do is build it. So we just run, if we called our function, if we written our, written our code in this app.py, then we just run dot slash app.py uh, space build. And then, um, then we just serve it. So why don't I try that now? And hopefully things will work. So let me get, yeah, I lost my terminal. Uh, 
One second. There we go. Oh, that's good. Uh, can you guys see that, or is that a little too small? I'll blow it up even more. Um, okay, cool. Let's see. So I've basically already written. Um, well, this is okay. So this is the so I have a Python file already written here, but I'll just walk through it for you quickly again, so you can see what's going on. Um, uh, basically, here you can just see like I've imported uh, from Bowtie the two control the two widgets that I want to use. So again, it's a Plotly uh, widget and the dropdown widget. Um, I made a slight change, and so my dropdown widget has uh, just a range of values and labels. So it's just uh, one to five. Um, then on my callback, um, I'm just making a simple sine wave. So you know that's everyone's first dashboard uh, right there. Um, and then I'm just creating a, yeah, just creating a sine wave and then creating the plot and updating the plot uh, with my do all command. Uh, then I'm making my command line interface and then my layout. I'm also passing in this debug equals true thing, uh, which gets passed into Flask. Um, that'll, that just helps uh, me when I'm in development. And then I add my plot in my dropdown and subscribe my callback to my dropdown on change event. And then so that's, that's all I'm, and I'm set to go. So let's let's build that, and this will take a minute to do its thing. Basically, all it's doing here is is downloading uh, packages from npm and then uh, and then bundling them up into um, uh, a JavaScript one large JavaScript file. So this will just uh, take a moment. And that's it. So uh, you can see here that the bundle that I made is quite large. Uh, there's ways to, to reduce that size, but it's 30 megabytes of JavaScript stuff. Um, but no big deal. <laughs> so um, so this is running the running the bowtie up. And let me try to bring this up here. So by default, I just I just have it running on uh, port nine 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 one, and a little too large. So here you can see the dropdown, and so as soon as we um, as soon as we select a value, it just updates it just updates the plot um, with uh, with the frequency that we um, with using the value that we selected. So uh, it's just using a frequency of one, two, three, four, five, which I basically set up so that you know the number of periods that you get is the number that you select. So if we select four, five, you know, yada yada yada. Um, so that's that's basically um, like your first bow tie up. So pretty simple, right? I think. <laughs> uh, cool. So. Let me get back. Okay. Apologies. I was supposed to, I was supposed to show that before I started coding, but um, and you guys made it through the first stage of the talk, so congratulations. <laughs> um, so now I guess I want to talk about a little bit about some more advanced advanced things you can do with bow ties. So start. Um, I have some rapid prototyping tips that I've kind of learned as I've been developing uh, and as I've been using bow tie. Um, uh, so, number one is basically set layout debug equals true. Um, if you know if you've used Flask before, if you set debug equals true with Flask, 
then you know that every time you write some code and save it, then the Flask server automatically restarts. And this can make uh, prototyping very fast. Because every time you, every time, like for instance, you update a callback or add some new functionality or callback, then the Bowtie server will basically, or the Flask server will basically restart. And you can just run that code straight away without having to restart uh, the server. Um, next is minimize, minimize the build times by architecting your app at the beginning. So as you saw, to, saw when we built the app, it took about a minute. And so that, you know that's, that's annoying time that we're waiting, that we're not doing anything productive, really. So if you can basically select all your components that you want to use and lay them out um, and set up all the callbacks correctly, you don't need to define the logic of the callbacks, but just basically lay out everything and connect all your callbacks to events and then you can just put passes on all the functions that you make and then build it once and then you can update the functionality as you go. Um, and then you don't need to rebuild it. You can just have the server restart. Um, that way you can, you, don't have to, you can only do that build once and you don't ever have to do it again and you're set. And last is sometimes, even for me, it's kind of annoying to figure out sometimes what are, what are the data types that I'm getting from some of these, uh, some of these widgets. So for instance, if I'm getting a if I'm using a Plotly event and I want to select some data, it's going to send me, it's going to send me a data about all those points. So I'm going to get a bunch of, I'm basically going to get a huge dict of data about those things. So I'm going to get like X and Y values uh, index into into my, into the, the data point into into that array and a bunch of other a bunch of other attributes. So what I do when I when I'm dealing with like Plotly and I want to deal with and I want to deal with events like that is I'll just use one of these options, either just print out the print out the the payload that I get, or use um, use a debugger, and so you know, pick your favorite and and go for it. Um, now, I guess I just kind of want to get into some advanced features. Um, so uh, I guess it's kind of like a core um, a core feature of, of Bowtie. Um, but since it was one of the main motivations for me making Bowtie, I just thought I'd I'd wanted to highlight it again. Um, so as I mentioned before, Plotly is a very featureful JavaScript charting library. Um, it has several events uh, that you can hook into, and Bowtie exposes uh, three event types that I found very valuable, which are the ability to select um, select events, click on events, and hover over events. And I'll send demos later so we can actually see this see this in action. Um, and like I was kind of saying before, the data returns is not very well documented. So, but but if with a little bit of perseverance, it's not too hard to figure out. Um, Next is sort of the ability to subscribe to multiple multiple events. So when I was first developing Bowtie, I experienced experienced this quite often. So I'd have like a bunch of controllers that would be that would define the inputs to various things. So for instance, if I'm building like a um, like for instance a gradient boosted classifier, if you remember with that, that that has several parameters that you can choose from, like the depth of the tree, the number of estimators that you're using, and so you know I, I was building. Uh, controllers that would let me let me choose between all those different uh, parameters that I could give to my classifier, um, and it would be really it was really nice. I, it was really annoying because I had to basically set up a callback for each individual one, and then get the states uh, for each of those different controllers, and that's turned out to be super cumbersome, and I needed to fix it. Um, so as I see as we'll see right here, like. Um, I hope you guys can see this, but I'll try to describe describe it. But um, so, for instance, if we have our callback, uh, we we have here two widgets that we want to we want to have inputs to that we want to do that we want to run some code on, right? So that's what this foo function is. It has two inputs, let's say, that come from widgets A and B, and in order to in order to run that code, I need to set up two callbacks: one that get one that sets up, uh, one that triggers and runs response to event from widget A and then one that responds to an event from trigger, uh, from trigger B. Um, and then each of those callbacks, I need to get the value of the other widget and then finally call foo. Uh, but you know, that, that problem scales linearly uh, with the number of widgets that you have and you have n functions for n different inputs. And so that was just a real big um, pain in the neck. And so then um, I just added the feature um, like a few months ago so that I could subscribe to multiple uh, multiple events um, with a single with a single line. So here, um, I have a function that wants inputs from like three different three different sources. So you can imagine this could be a one drop down, a second drop down, and then a toggle uh, widget. And then all I need to do to subscribe is just pass the function and then pass all three 
all three um, widgets that I, all three events that I want to uh, listen to, and then behind the scenes, I'm setting up all those callbacks uh, for you, and you don't need to worry about the details. Um, so that turned out to be a big uh, time saver for me. Um, I also have scheduling and loading events. So as you noticed, uh, when I first refreshed that page, the plot didn't appear right away. I could do that with um, with these sorts of things. Um, these intrinsic events, I guess, as I'll say. Um, so for instance, I could have uh, called layout.load uh, to run a function as soon as a user uh, uh, enters the web page or loads the web page, and that function will get run. Uh, so I could have uh, loaded up a plot uh, that way, and so the user isn't staring, staring at a blank screen, and at least has some idea of what, at least the user would have some idea of what they're looking at without having to do some interaction. And secondly, I can also uh, schedule events um, with my with the schedule uh, task. So, so in this case, this function is saying, I want function func to be called every five seconds. And so this can be, you know, used for a variety of things like you know whether it's updating the stock market um, or you know grabbing new data um, from whatever whatever source that you want. Um, next, I have like storing data with the client. So multiple people can connect to these bowtie dashboards, um, and sometimes it's sometimes it's pretty handy to be able to uh, store data with the client, like uh, data that's specific to that client. Um, you could do it server side, but it turned out to be kind of a. I thought it was kind of a pain in the neck to try to figure that out. So I figured, well, let's just send, let's just send the data over to the client and store it in the browser. I mean, for small amounts of data, that doesn't seem seems fine to me. So uh, that's that's kind of what I did. Um, so there's this bowtie.cache module, which basically looks like a key value store. You can pass it, um, you can pass it a key, uh, like a string. For the key, and then you can pass it any value that you want as long as that value is uh, basically JSON serializable. Uh, you can store that data. So, for instance, if you want to store some data for an expensive computation, like that TSNI graph that I showed earlier, uh, that might take like 10 seconds to run. And so, you know, every time that someone's uh, uh, changing something with their plot, I don't want to wait 10 seconds for that plot to show up. I can just store the results of that TSNI, and then it'll pop up immediately by just fetching it from the client. Um, similarly, like the client might have. Um, their own their own special their own data that they wanna that you want to store with them and not with other client not with other uh, people that are connecting to your dashboard um, there's also progress indicators um, so if you want so this can be very helpful for a variety of reasons as you might imagine but all visual widgets have an attached progress indicator that you can hook into um, by default they are invisible so uh, they don't get in your way so if you're uh, so if you're happy not having any, any progress indicators, you can completely ignore them as much as you want. Uh, but it turns out that it's really helpful for like long computations or for slow I/O that you can at least have some indicator that your that your function isn't died or hasn't aired out, stuff like that. Um, and you can also indicate uh, functions that have that have aired out that way too. Um, so if you guys are familiar with um, CSS grid at all, like some of the new bowtie, some of the new uh, web technologies. Um, you probably you might know about this. Uh, I don't know how much it was hyped up in the front end community, but probably I would imagine it seems like a pretty cool feature. Um, before bowtie was using flexbox, and that was okay, but it was kind of a pain to use. I thought um, essentially it's a new web standard that lets you lay out stuff on a web page in a in a grid like fashion, and it turns out to be very uh, very powerful. I'm surprised it took this long to get get something like that. Honestly, um, the bowtie uses this and it tries to make like a, a Pythonic sensible interface for you to uh, lay out your components. Um, and so, as you might know, uh, CSS Grid was just released on the major browsers like probably like earlier this year, I think. Um, and so, as a result of that, to use bowtie, you really need a pretty up to date browser like uh, CSS Grid. I think was implemented in Chrome 57, like Firefox 52, so you know IE users are kind of out of luck, sadly. So, so uh, the layout class lets you uh, lets you utilize this, and so with the layout, you can specify the number of rows and columns that you that you want in your grid, um, and then when you call the dot add method, which I which I showed you earlier, um, you didn't see the number of rows the me using this feature because 
by default, the add method will just use the first available cell that it can find. But you can also pass it um, uh, like a start row and an end row and a start column and an end column. And so it can span um, as many rows and columns as you want or just span one row and column. And so, uh, so that gives you a lot of power to lay out your app in whatever way you, way you would like. Um, and rows and columns, you can also resize, you can have them be arbitrarily sized. So you can size them based off of pixels, uh, the percentage of the web browser that is available, web browser space that's available, and also the fraction of the available unused space. So essentially, I'm just exposing all the features of CSS Grid um, to you. Uh, so I'm not really creating anything novel here, just, just the API. Um, there's also authentication. Um, Blast makes it easy for you to do basic authentication. So uh, if you guys don't know what basic authentication is, uh, it's just a little drop down. It's a little pop-up that pops up at the top of your browser. Um, otherwise, you just in input a simple username and password. Um, it'd be nice to have a more generic authentication solution, but one big caveat is I'm not a security expert, so don't trust me. I wouldn't trust this for anything really serious. So um, you'd probably need to roll your own solution uh, to really make sure your, your application is secure if you have sensitive data there. So just be aware of that. Um, so now I guess I just want to do some do some demos that kind of show off that show off some of those things I was just discussing. So let me pull up my terminal again. Let me kill this. Let's see what demos I have here. So the gentleman earlier was talking about stocks. Maybe he might find this uh, might find this dashboard useful. So I'll show off the I'll show off the application first, and then we can dive into the code so you guys can have some idea of like uh, what was what was going on underneath the scenes. So I already have this built, so I can just serve it. Um, but it'll take us just a second and let me I did not make this easy for myself. Okay. I just need to do a hard refresh to refresh the cache. Um, oh, it was up today. Okay. So um, there's no instructions here, so apologies for that. But um, what I can do here is in these two text boxes, I can, I can enter in any stock ticker, ticker symbol, and then uh, a few plots will get generated uh, from that. So um, I only know text stocks off the top of my head, so that's what we're going to do, I think. Um, so Apple and Google. Uh, and so here you can see the progress indicator. Uh, it's using um, pandas to pandas data reader to uh, to fetch uh, fetch data going back to I guess 2010 um, uh, like the the daily data um, and what this is plotting is it's plotting the log returns of the close of the close value so you're gonna get get a sense of like uh, how well each stock how well each stock was doing over the course of time um, and so what this first plot is it's just a scatter plot. Um, plotting the log returns of Apple against Google. So I have Apple here on my x-axis, and I have Google here on my y-axis. So you can kind of see um, that they're kind of correlated. And unfortunately, my my screen is a bit. Uh, maybe I can. Yeah, you can. You guys can still see that. Let me refresh. This isn't responsive. Uh, so anytime you uh, resize your browser, uh, you'll need to refresh to update the the sizes of your widgets. Um, I'm not a front-end developer, so I'm not really good at that kind of stuff. Um, so you can kind of see that there's there's a positive correlation. So usually, I mean, I mean, this is just me eyeballing it, but it looks like generally when Apple does well on a given day, then Google typically does well. Um, I'm just looking at the the x like the x y line. It seems like there's a, a correlation there. Um, and then on here, here's just two of the two. Um, the two companies' ticker prices plotted over time. Um, so you're thinking, like, no big deal. What, 
what is this guy showing me? Um, like you yeah, haven't shown me any interaction so far. So, uh, so what I can do here is let's say I want to focus in on uh, maybe a certain region of time. Um, I don't really have any any sense of time that would be a good one to look at. So I'll just take a little bit of time here, um, and then I can use uh, the box select tool uh, from Plotly uh, to select some select some win length of time here. Some winter of winter fall of 2014 and then um, that shows that that then uh, plots uh, basically highlights the correlation uh, from the from that region of time so, so I think that's pretty cool that you can select select the region of time and then have that have the update the plot so I'm keeping all the data that I used uh, to plot my original scatter plot and then I'm just highlighting the highlighting the plots that or highlighting the data points uh, that I selected there um, and so I can do that as many times as I want and just uh, you know, look at Qualcomm, Qualcomm just to prove to you that this isn't like hard coded in. Um, that's, uh, that's really all the stock tickers I know, so I don't know any others. Uh, apologies. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have a good suggestion? CVX. CVX? Okay. I don't know what is CVX, Devron. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> let me uh, let me give that another shot. I wonder if it doesn't like. Uh, can I have another company? C O O. Y H O O. Oh, why? Yes. Yahoo. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Okay. Well, maybe there's a bias towards tech companies here. I'm not sure. Um, sorry. Oh, Ford. Four characters stock. Three characters of that. Oh, oh, yeah. That might be it, actually. Well, we can take a look at the code and see if see if you can spot the bug. <laughs> um, so let me just. Yeah. Let me. Okay. So. Um, so here I'm just doing some standard imports. Um, Pendulum is just a time library um, that makes it work, in my opinion, makes it easier to work with daytime objects. Pandas NumPy, um, and here this is a data science crowd, so I think most of you are probably familiar with that. And then Pandas Data Reader is the tool that I'm using to pull stock symbols from. Um, I'm also using the cache mechanism, and I'm and here I'm importing Plotly. Uh, a text, the two text boxes that you saw to enter in, um, enter in the stock symbols, and then the button to to launch the query, and then I'm using also Plotly wrapper to generate the plots. So here are my two plots: uh, the joint plot and the time plot. And then I have my two stock text boxes and the button. Um, this is just my how I'm generating log returns. Um, here's my clicks callback. So when you click on the button, it gets the two stock ticker symbols. Um, I'm setting up the setting up the progress bar, so just setting it to be visible in zero percent. Um, then I'm getting the data for the first stock, stocker symbols, stock ticker symbol, and the second talk, stock ticker symbol. Um, so, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I can identify what might have been going wrong for CVX, but uh, I'll have to try that out later. Yeah. Oh, you noticed that? Oh, yeah. I don't know what's. Hmm. I don't know what have been going on there. Maybe I can. Ah, huh. Interesting. Well, that was for WHOO, which. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's a. Uh, I think I know what's going on. So it must have not been able to get. As much data, the same amount of data um, 
from Apple as it did from CVX. So I think I, I implicitly assumed that the amount of data was the same. So I think that is where the bug is. Um, so anyway, um, then I'm just commuting the log returns. I'm storing um, the log returns with the user, with the, with the browser. Um, then I'm making a plot and, and sending it to my joint plot. I'm making the plot for the time series plot and then sending that to my time plot. Um, and then when then here's kind of the interesting thing I think is here's my selection event. So uh, when I select uh, a series of points that gets sent in as an argument to this, so the points is basically a JSON type of object, and so it's a list. And in that list, I have I have this points uh, points key, which then I can grab the the, the index of the of the array, and then I can I can use that to highlight. Uh, highlight the certain the points that I want in my in my joint plot. So so here I'm I'm just putting that in my this nums list and then I'm I'm getting the unique values and I'm getting the the log returns back from my cache and I'm basically updating the plots again or at least the joint plot. So I'm doing the base plot here again and then here I'm highlighting the the values I selected and and then I'm sending that to the do the plot um, to update again. Um, so here you, can, you, here you can see me. Uh, here's now where I set up the set up the layout. Um, so as you can see, I'm using two rows because uh, I have those two plots on top of each other. Um, and then I'm just adding um, the joint plot and the time plot, and then adding all three controllers to my sidebar. And then I'm setting up my my events. And so this is essentially all the code that I need to write. This is all the code I need to write in that then. You know, 100 or so lines, and in my opinion, I think this is pretty straightforward. But then again, I wrote the library, so I'm always always interested in the users and seeing how easy it is uh, for others that are not familiar with uh, this to see how easy it is for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that I think is I think it's reusing uh, the cache. So Yarn is a tool created by Facebook to try to make that intelligent. And so I think it, it'll it'll try to look at your. Um, I think it'll look to see if there's any, like updates, uh, for the packages that you've selected. But since I have all the packages pinned to a certain version, it's going to look in your local cache and see that you have all those versions of all the software already. So it's not going to uh, re-download those things. It's just going to check. To make sure that you have them, and if it doesn't, then I'll update it. So, yes, in the back. Uh, yeah. Um, so I went over that kind of quickly, and I realized. Oh yes. Um, yeah, I should repeat the question. Um, I believe so. I'm not familiar with, um, yeah, so uh, the first question was, uh, where do we get the data from uh, for the stocks? And the second question was, is that a RESTful query? Um, uh, the answer to the first question is that it's using uh, Pandas Data Reader, which has um, some convenient tools for grabbing data from uh, public data sources, like getting stock ticker data from Google or Yahoo that's built into Pandas Data Reader. Uh, that's what this thing is. Uh, I read, for some reason, I called it PBR. It should be PDR, but um, whatever. Uh, so, and then it's just using uh, it's just using Google Google's API, uh, basically just doing a RESTful query to Google and getting the data that way underneath the scenes. Um, I believe so. I mean, this is packaging up into a pandas data frame for you. Uh, but yeah. Cool. So that's that was my stock demo. Um, uh, let's see. I think I have a few others here. So, so I've done some stuff. So I used to be a, I used to do some uh, Kaggle competitions. And if you guys have used Kaggle, I think there's this. I haven't really played around with this data set very much, but there's this Titanic data set, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, well, I mean, it's kind of morbid, I guess, but. <laughs> uh, Essentially, it's just uh, taking, it's just cataloging all the all the data from uh, the Titanic, the population of 
people that were on the Titanic and whether or not they, they survived or not. And then there's a bunch of attributes about those people, like their age, uh, sex, um, what fare they paid, you know, where they onboarded, stuff like that. Um, so let me pull that up. So um, to explain what's going on here, I built a I built a pretty simple classifier. I just basically took an out of the box gradient booster classifier and trained it on. Uh, basically, gave it pretty much all the data and let it just do its thing. Um, I split it up into a train set and test set, and then and then here's I'm here I'm plotting the residual the residual errors. So on the y-axis here um, is true minus predict um, for both my test set and my train set. So basically, what this is saying is if if I have my data points at the top end, that means my model that the person actually survived, but my model thought that the person uh, should have died. Uh, uh, similarly, on the flip side of that, uh, if it's negative one, that means um, that uh, that the person died when my model actually thought uh, the person should have survived based off of their characteristics. Um, and I'm sorry. Can you? Um, yeah, I mean, you can kind of, I think, intuitively think that, oh, the, sorry, the question was, like, what are the kind of intuitive factors that would go into, like, whether or not a person survived or not? Um, uh, the best I can do is kind of give you an intuitive explanation. From my point of view, I haven't really dug into this uh, data set very much or looked at, like, what others have tried, but just intuitively speaking, uh, it seems like females have a generally high chance of survival, people who are wealthy, people who are, are so yeah, the first class, there's a few different classes of people on, on the Titanic. There's first, second, and third class. So I think those are the, those are the primary factors. And I think we'll, we'll see this in a second. Um, so I have this big empty space on the right. And so you're probably wondering, what is that for? Um, so I can go ahead and select, uh, select data here. And then this automatically populates, uh, populates a couple tables. Uh, with data about about those points that I selected. So the thing I like about this is that when you're doing machine learning, uh, it's very helpful. It can be very helpful to try to identify like where your models are failing or on which data points you're doing very poorly. Um, uh, one guy, uh, Nick Kridler, uh, gave a talk about that, like how he did very well in the whale competition data set for Keiko by by inspecting the points where he was doing very poorly and and then modifying his model to to do better on those on those data points. Um, so here, for instance, um, on the top on the top table, um, wish this showed up better. Um, but on the top table, uh, we have all the attributes for all those data points I selected. So you can see uh, survived. If they survived, it's one. Uh, the the class uh, where they were living. So first class is the is the top class or the best class, um, down to three. Um, and the name of the person, sex. Uh, one means male. So so the model definitely thinks has a high bias towards if it's male, it thinks it, it thinks the person died. So, so as and then I have the summary statistics on the bottom here, so you can see that out of all the points I selected, 84% uh, of them uh, were male. So the the model has a very high bias towards thinking males uh, died. Um, and then, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that that is what happened. Um, and then I have a few other extra attributes that you can check out there, but. Um, but I think this could be very useful for for competing machine learning competitions like Kaggle, so you can easily, or you know, for whatever project you might have, um, to identify the outliers and investigate them more easily. And you don't need to uh, you don't need to do any panda or program manipulation. You can just select data points and see like which which points that look like outliers to you, and then try to try to come up with your own uh, conclusions about how you can uh, improve your model. Uh, so, yes. So in this example, did you just load the data frame from a CSV you had? Yeah, I just really I just loaded the data frame from a CSV, ran it through a ran it through a model, and then just plotting the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll I'll try to answer that a little bit later in the talk. Uh, the question was like, how do I get JavaScript events to the to the Python server? But I'll try to answer that later. 
Um, yes. Um, to that table? Uh, yeah, there'd be a, you could you could add a text box and then you know whenever you hit enter or click the button you could add it add it to the data frame if you wanted. Yeah, totally. Uh, the question was, uh, is there a way that you could add data uh, to the to the data frame or table, DSV, what have you? Um, so just take a quick glance at the file. Um, uh, basically, most of this top stuff. Uh, we can ignore. Um, this is me just uh, building the model, down the, um, basically reading the data. Here I'm making my classifier, choosing which features, splitting up the data into a train test, uh, train set, test set, uh, doing that whole whole thing. Um, then here I'm setting up the setting up my plotly uh, widgets in my in my table widget. So I have a, a train plot and a test plot that you saw on the left hand side, and then I have my then I have the two table widgets, one to show the individual people, and then one to show the summary statistics of the of the population I selected. Um, uh, so by default on load, I'm showing the two plots that you saw, so that's how I'm getting the plots to show up immediately, um, unlike the other uh, examples that I had. And then um, and then I have these two these two callbacks that run in response to me selecting points on either my training set or my test set, and so there I'm just uh, basically, just getting the, the getting the point number that I select, and then indexing it into my into my data frame that I have, and then and then um, putting those things into a table and, and updating them, sending them to the sending them to the browser. Um, and then here I am laying out the laying it out. So so here I'm using a little bit more fancy fancy stuff. So here I have three rows and two columns. So it may not have seemed like I have three rows, but um, but I'll get to that in a second. And also, I set the sidebar equal to false, so I don't have that navigation bar show up since I'm not since I wasn't using any control widgets. I didn't need to didn't need to have that this time. Um, so here I'm using some of the features of CSS Grid to kind of finely tune or finally modify like how I want my widgets to show up. So I have two rows. Um, or I have three rows. The first row basically gets um, I just basically give it give it a numerical number. So I just give it three. One and then two. Uh, that's just basically telling you how how big how big of the pie that it should take. So this first row is three, so it's taking up basically 50% because these three numbers add up to six. Um, this this number this one is taking up one sixth. That's the size of, or I'm sorry, this one is taking up two. So that's uh, one third, which is the size of that smaller table there. So you can so with these sort of features, you can basically modify your layout and and finally tune and figure out like uh, just you know, uh, tweak your layout however you want um, to to fit your needs. Um, and then I'm also adding uh, those things here and specifying the rows and columns. Um, I apologize, this is kind of indecis indecipherable, but you have to trust me that I'm basically selecting uh, the rows and columns and the spans of rows and columns with these numbers here. Um, I'll kind of leave that. Um, for you to look at the docs later to see what those numbers mean, but basically it's just the start rows and the start columns and the end rows and end columns. And then I'm hooking up my subscribe um, functions to listen for select events on my plots, and then I'm just and then I have my load function get called, so that way uh, when I load up the browser, load up the web page, I'll have those plots immediately plotted for me. Uh, let's see. I think the last demo that I have is um, looking at some TSA data. Um, So uh, this TSA data that I have, it's basically telling me the number of incidents that have happened over um, over since the TSA was founded, like or incepted, I think, like in 2002 or something. So every time a customer complains about lost baggage or damaged baggage, uh, that would be recorded in this data set, and you can download this data um, uh, for free from the TSA from the TSA website. So 
what I'm showing by default is uh, the top five airports that have the most, uh, the most uh, basically incidents filed. So unsurprisingly, uh, you see the top, you see major hubs at the top. So we have LAX uh, in top with around 9,000 complaints, then JFK, Newark, O'Hare, Miami International. Um, and I can use this slider to change the number of um, change the number of airports I show to make it so you can't even read anything or um, or or lower it so that you can uh, see see more that you want. Um, and I can also change this to to group it by airline, um, so you can see uh, the most common <laughs> airlines that have uh, have a lot of lots of complaints against them. Um, I didn't normalize this by any sorts of amount of traffic that gets seen, so uh, unsurprisingly, the major carriers have the highest incidents. So Delta, American Airlines, Southwest, United US Air, um, going on the list. Um, this is basically from 2002 uh, to I think the end of 2015, if I recall. Um, and then I can also uh, look at this if I select airline airports. Uh, I can look at this on a map view. So we can see um, the major those major hubs plotted on um, on the U.S. Uh, U.S. map, and they're roughly. I tried to make the bubbles so that they looked so they were still legible and somewhat sized by the amount of incidents that that you have. And you can then hover over these and see. You know, this is just what Plotly gives you. You can see which you know the coordinates and the name of the name of the airport. Uh, and then you can also click on these and see. Um, see the incidents over time. So here, I mean, roughly, I think um, the data started accumulating in 2003, and then I have it up to the end of 2015 there. Um, so all I plotted here is um, I basically take an accumulative sum of whenever someone lodged a, lodged a complaint, I add one to a counter, and I plot that over time. So you can kind of see maybe there's an inflection point, maybe somewhere around 2008, so I don't know if you can read anything to this data, but maybe maybe processes got better after 2008 and the, and the uh, number of complaints slowed down a bit. Um, and you can click on any of these points and get, uh, get an updated view for Seattle, uh, Chicago, O'Hare, and just kind of get a quick glimpse of the data. Um, you, can also, you can also select uh, data for, with this dropdown, so I can choose uh, our local our local favorites here, uh, San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland. And so you can see kind of an interesting, looks kind of, I don't know, looks kind of interesting. I don't know if you, how much you can really infer from this graph, but uh, it seems like San Francisco has, has flattened out after a kind of a high, high incident rate in the mid, mid 2000s, whereas uh, Oakland is still climbing, climbing quickly compared to the other two uh, uh, airports. So. It's kind of a fun, fun thing you can do. Um, and and then to take a quick, quick look at, at how that is implemented. Oh, sorry. Um, let's see. Try to let's try to highlight the important bits here. Uh, but like for the drop down, I have the multi select equals true. Um, here I'm reading in the the TSA data. Um, here's where I'm using uh, uh, multiple events to to run a to run this event. So I'm keying into the, so I'm using the on off toggle. I'm using the map view, and then I'm also using the slider um, to update that plot. So I have three different widgets that I'm that I'm uh, that I'm using. Uh, the map view is a trigger to turn off, map, turn on and off the map view, and then I'm updating the, the top plot there with this with this function. Um, this this p events thing is the is when I click on the click on points in the map or in the bar graph. I could also click on points and have that update the graph. And then the the d events is the drop down events, so I can choose uh, multiple uh, airports or airlines and have them. Have them plot the time series data, um, and then here I'm just. This is a pretty simple, 
Uh, simple layout, so nothing too fancy. Just everything's equally sized, so I don't need to do any monkeying with the uh, with the CSS grid stuff. And then I'm just adding all these all those controller widgets to the sidebar, and then just adding my two plots, and then hooking up my hooking up my subscription. So as you can see here, I'm using the multiple events, and then that uh, makes things super simple for me. And and that was done in you know, 110 lines of code, so not too bad. Uh, let's see. I think that was. I don't know. Uh, do I dare look at the? Is the chat doing okay? Is anybody using that? Good chat. <laughs> Good chat. Yeah. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> if people want to come ask me about my environment, uh, feel free. <laughs> nice, uh, good stuff, guys. <laughs> I am using Vim and Fish, so good guesses there. Um, yeah, I'll show you guys the, the chat app. I think it's it's kind of cute. I mean, it's not, I didn't really build Bowtie to make uh, these sorts of other things, but uh, it was easy to do, um, so I just decided to give it a shot. I was kind of inspired by this 2016 PyCon talk by Miguel uh, Grunberg, which he gave like a three-hour tutorial about Flask and built a built a chat uh, app with with that three-hour time slot. So I thought it'd be fun. Um, so just to walk through it quickly, I'm not even using any visual widgets. I'm just using the text box and the button, um, and then I'm just making a Python queue. Uh, and I just have my, my text box for you to enter text, um, the click button uh, for, you to, for you to submit it, and then the, then the large chat. And I just have a few functions to, to get the text from you and, and send it to that, send it to this uh, um, lines object, which contains the group chat. Um, so as you can see, the, there's a max size of 50, so after 50, you know, it's just dropping. Uh, it just drops the last the last comment that was made, or the, you know, the oldest comment. Um, so what happens is, like, you can either click click the button or hit enter on the text box, and then um, it runs this code. So basically, it's just checking if the queue is full. If it is full, um, it's just popping the last item or the oldest item. It's taking your first 144 characters, and it's getting the current time, and then putting that as a tuple into the queue. And then it's telling the telling the chat to to update the to update itself, basically the string, um, uh, which gets which gets run here. So I'm basically just joining new lines together, and I'm processing that tuple with this two text entry. So I'm just putting in a timestamp, and then your text, um, and then updating the chat, um, and then I'm and then back down here. Sorry for jumping around a lot, but the talk that I'm resetting the talk to be an empty string, so you don't so you can't spam like a bunch of text really fast. Uh, at least that was the idea. Um, and then I'm also taking advantage of some CSS uh, grid features here. So I'm making two rows and two columns. And then I'm making the, the first row be only 40 pixels size, so your input isn't, isn't that large. And then the, then the column I'm making only 100 pixels wide, so the button on the right is, is constrained. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do they? How do? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. How do they find the? Yeah, I like launched it last night, and I I put the so I put the URL at the beginning of the talk, mm -hmm. kind of briefly. Yeah, it's I gave it to a couple people at work, but I don't know if they're talking too. But I think it's mostly people here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so and then I'm just adding the adding all those widgets to the to the layout, um, and then I'm just setting up all the subscriptions, and then so you don't have to refresh the page um, to see what other people are see, chatting about. Then uh, the chat automatically updates every five seconds, so you can so you can get an updated look of things. Uh, yeah. Cool. Oh yeah, uh, that was about that was 53 lines of code uh, to build an anonymous chat. So kind of fun. Uh, 
there we go. Cool. Um, so I guess I'm, let's see, a little over on time, I think. Um, well, I think I can still make it. Uh, so I'll just say deploying um, really quickly. I, I like Heroku. It's pretty, I mean, it's cheap. You can, I mean, I have all these apps installed on the free, free dyno. So um, you can look at the docs for more detailed instructions. Um, but if you're going to deploy something, uh, just set debug equals false. Uh, reinstall or recompile your app with uh, production. And so that's going to take that 30 megabyte JavaScript bundle that we talked about before and, and compress it down to one megabyte. So clients aren't downloading this huge JavaScript bundle every single time. Um, about half of that is, I think, due to Plotly. So if you don't use Plotly, it'll reduce the size even more. It's a pretty big library. Um, and then all you need to do is like uh, attach uh, attach these files. So there's the server server.py file where all the Flask stuff is hidden. If you want to take a look at that code, uh, feel free. Um, it's kind of horrendous. Um, so have some fun there. Uh, there's an index.html, which is just a really small HTML file. And then um, there's a, and then that's the bundle.js dot gzip file that gets made uh, when you compile with production settings. Um, so uh, I guess I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the tech stack. Um, so you guys are all like Python developers, you guys might be interested in like how this all kind of works underneath the hood. Um, so first of all, I'm using Flask socket IO. Um, so Bowtie is built on Flask and Flask socket IO primarily. Um, and Bowtie, as you saw from the code snippets, basically abstracts uh, basically everything away from all the Flask away from you. And I think this is good and bad, um, but I'll maybe say more about that later. Um, but you can still benefit from the Flask ecosystem. So, for example, I had a user um, submit an issue about wanting to um, put multiple Bowtie apps um, on different on different um, subdomains and. He was asking me how I could do that, or if there was something equivalent to a shiny server thing uh, for Bowtie, and I didn't really have like a good solution for him. But you know, he could he could just use um, some open source solutions that are available. So if he's familiar with Nginx, which I later found out and tried, uh, that is a viable solution to do what he wanted to do. And so you, you could use Nginx to scale uh, these Bowtie apps in 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 whatever way you pretty much want. I, I think I'm not a, I'm not an expert in Nginx. I'm still learning a lot myself. But I think it's I think it's pretty cool that that you can still use uh, these tools that are built around Flask to to enhance uh, enhance your your experience. And I, don't know, I still kind of wish that the that the user was able to touch Flask because I think it's a great API. I did abstract it away primarily because I wanted it to be really fast, easy, seamless for people to use. I didn't want to write a bunch of a bunch of boilerplate logic uh, to get these dashboards up and running. My main goal was to have these be very small snippets of code, so you can get a lot of functionality out of very, small, very little code. Um, next, um, what I'm using on the front end is essentially all React. Um, Nick Cridler, who is the author of Pixly, if you're familiar, wrote, wrote a blog post a while ago about, about using React with Python, um, and I kind of ran with it. I don't know, not knowing anything about React or any other front end frameworks, I just kind of chose React, and it seemed to, seemed to be pretty reasonable. Uh, just a bunch of JavaScript classes, essentially. And so all of my widgets are written in React. Um, so what that essentially means is that, like, if you or I wanted to make a new widget for Bowtie, you would need to make uh, make a new React class for it. So um, so often what I do is, if I want a new widget, I'll look for people that have already made uh, widgets in React, and I can just, they've done most of the work for me, and I can just borrow that and, and put it in Bowtie, and then, and then we all have a new, uh, new widget that we can put in our dashboards. And then um, the thing that really the thing that connects the two the two lands together um, uh, from JavaScript to, to Bowtie is is Socket IO. And fortunately, uh, there are awesome libraries out there to make it really easy for you to do this. And so Flask Socket IO uh, makes this uh, very very seamless. Um, so essentially, Socket IO. It's if you're familiar, um, I mean, I'm not an expert in this either. Uh, but I think it, I think it's kind of similar to sockets uh, for Linux. So it's kind of like a just a, a connection between it's a connection a one to one connection between the server to the user, and you can send whatever you want, and that connection remains open. And you can just send stuff back and forth as often as often as you want. And all you have to do is basically give it give it a event, and you can op optionally give it a payload, and then you can send stuff back and forth that way. 
Um, so for example, the event for updating Plotly is uh, this ID uh, hashtag all. So for instance, if I've, um, the ID is just an enumeration of all the widgets that I have. So for instance, if I have two Plotly plots, I can distinguish between them two, the two of them by one will have the ID of one and one will have the ID of two. And then I can just send this event. So one hashtag all, and then send it the data, send it the JSON data to update its plot uh, through Socket.io. And then I handle that through my React class and then updates the plot for you. And then you don't even, and so essentially at the end of the day, all this is kind of hidden away from you. Um, and you don't need to worry about all this and it just kind of happens magically underneath the scenes. Um, and additionally, the message payloads are encoded with message fact to try to reduce the payload size some. I think I might try to do more in this area. Maybe I might gzip stuff too to try to, because so, some of those poly plots um, uh, can generate a lot of data really quickly. Um, and then lastly, there's these JavaScript tools that I highlighted before. So Yarn is a tool from Facebook for downloading packages. Um, Webpack is basically a JavaScript kind of bundler minimizer, lets you do a lot of awesome things. Hard to use, um, admittedly, but I got it working. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate, it's kind of a leaky abstraction. I don't want, I don't want you guys or myself, like as a Python user, to have to worry about this stuff. You have to install it yourself, but I didn't want to turn Bowtie into a node uh, delivery device, so I neglected to do that. So I leave that work up to you. <laughs> um, cool. So this is so we're getting towards the end. Um, just want to talk about some some kind of some of the work and goals that I want for want for Bowtie. So I'll first start off with some things that I don't like. So it's annoying that you have to recompile your app to run it. Um, this is probably one of the things I hate the most compared to other apps like uh, I think Pixly and and Dash. I said I wasn't going to compare things, but I guess I am. Um, uh, most of them don't require you to compile your app. So I think they're just downloading uh, things directly from CDNs, uh, the JavaScript from CDNs, and just you just write the code and then you run it. There's no compilation place. There's no compilation step that takes place. So that's really nice. I think that's a big advantage for them. Um, also compared to other some other tools, Bowtie can be not as snappy. I mean, I think most of the demos you saw, I think it looked pretty, I would say it looked pretty responsive, but um, but it does have to take a like kind of a round trip from the JavaScript to the Python back to the JavaScript to update update plots. I mean, some of their tools just define their Java, define their callbacks directly in JavaScript, and they have an advantage there that while well, they don't get to code in Python, which is what I want to do, they can code all their stuff in JavaScript, uh, which is great if you can do all your manipulation in JavaScript. But I didn't want to do that, so I made that sacrifice to yeah, maybe it's not as snappy, but I can do everything in Python. Um, and there might be too much magic happening behind the scenes. I think it, I think when users run into problems, or at least I've had a couple issues um, that have popped up on my on my GitHub page, um, where I think it's it's tricky for users to debug problems. And so I think I need to improve that. Um, I kind of touched on some of these points uh, earlier, but user experience goals. So number one, uh, I want basically to give you guys wherever is using Bowtie, the power to create basically as much interactivity uh, as you want. Um, like uh, if there's any limit, I'd be interested in hearing what you're trying to do that you can't accomplish. And I'd be interested in trying to fix that and make and make Bowtie better. Um, I want it to be basically very painless uh, to rapid prototype. Um, if there's any pain associated, if there's any pain whatsoever, I basically try to eliminate because I don't want any, any slowdown in, in developing these dashboards, because any anytime there's slowdowns um, or pain points, then that's going to make me not want to develop the dashboard because I know there's going to be pain uh, coming. So I want to make that as seamless as possible. Um, and then, sort of lastly, I want it to be easy to share with others, and so that kind of goes along with like being able to deploy to Heroku and and stuff like that. Um, some non goals are uh, I don't I don't ever envision happening like building a GUI for laying out widgets. Uh, you're going to have to deal with programming the layout yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's the kind of guy I am. Um, and then I don't, my, I'm, I'm a data scientist, so my focus is on building data science dashboards. Not really interested in a generic web app builder. I mean, if people can do it with Bowtie, then that's great, but that's not really my, my end goal with Bowtie. Um, and so kind of lastly, some of the lofty goals I have are 
Well, it becomes shiny. Um, uh, but uh, OK, but seriously, um, I'm one guy. Shiny is a huge company, or you know, pretty, I think, sizable company. So you know, uh, I need to have realistic expectations. I'm not doing this for my day job. So, um, but number one, uh, Bowtie needs to be more robust and have better testing. Um, the number, of, the surface area features on Bowtie is just is is getting pretty large at this point, and I can't test them by hand uh, quickly anymore. So, the number of tests that I've written is pretty limited, and I think that needs to needs to grow. And so, in order to make sure that people aren't uh, posting or running the problems every time um, they try to use Bowtie. Now you want to make it easier to scale and deploy. Um, I think you have to do that starting manually right now. It's not very streamlined, so I want to have some better, it'd be nice to have some better tools in place to do that. Um, and then um, uh, these, are less, these are less important, but having more charting libraries, having more widgets, those are all nice things. I can do them and they're relatively easy to do. I just need to uh, spend like half an hour uh, writing something depending on the complexity of the widget and I can have something new in bow tie um, and maybe make it look nicer um, or maybe make it easier to make it look nicer um, I don't know I think I think most of those dashboards looked reasonably well so I'm I'm not too worried about it but um, that might be nice um, and then lastly someone on reddit posted this to me was asked me this question but Jupyter integration is it possible and I immediately thought like uh, no that's uh, <laughs> That's kind of crazy, uh, but I don't know. It kind of the idea kind of stuck with me, and I've been thinking more more and more about it. And I still think the there's some technical challenges there to get the the bow tie server to talk to the the IPython kernel and getting that all figured out. But um, I think I think if it were possible, it'd be really powerful because it is kind of annoying. I do most of my work in Jupyter notebooks. If I could somehow integrate bow tie into that process, that'd be that'd be pretty slick. Um, but ultimately, my real goal is just to make sure Bowtie, um, whether it becomes the shiny of Python or not, I just kind of want to move the dashboarding tool, tools uh, forward in some direction. I, like before I started this, I, I thought like this is like kind of big pain in the neck to do anything. So I hope at the very least I've, I can show an example of like how, how easy it can be. And, and hopefully, whether or not it's me that moves, takes it from here or someone else, um, hopefully this can be a, uh, a stepping stone. And lastly, I just want to thank um, some of my colleagues from Vertigris. I don't think, I don't see any of them here tonight, but Danny Servan, Jared Kruzek, Martin Chang, uh, Michael Roberts, they uh, helped give me feedback early off, early in the process and, and make it, make uh, Bowtie and what it is today. And, and to Jeff um, and the organizers for letting me present here tonight. Uh, that was very nice of them. Um, and lastly, just uh, here's some resources. So there's my there's the Bowtie GitHub. Um, I don't have the slides posted yet, but I plan on putting them on GitHub later, probably later tonight or tomorrow. And then um, the docs are are there. They're also linked on on my GitHub page, but they're also on Read the Docs. So um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We're uh, almost out of time. We have to be done by 9 o'clock. So uh, why don't we go ahead and end now, have lots of pizza, and come up and ask lots of questions. Before you go, though, uh, if anyone has not been to PyCon and is so interested, I hate throwing away things. Here's a bag for all the you know the, the bags that throw away. I'm going to leave it here if anybody wants one. Two data science cheat sheets for Python for data science, SciPy, and one for, uh, OK. So they're here if anybody wants one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.